The importance of maritime trade for the global economy can't be understated. After all, roughly 80% of all goods transported worldwide are transported by sea. That's why global nations continuously invest in maritime infrastructure, striving to enhance their geopolitical influence by strategically controlling critical maritime routes. But there's a single country poised to become a key player in the future of maritime trade. Canada. Canada's promising future rests on a few essential factors — its extensive coastline, ice-free ports, and strategic location. However, none of these factors is as crucial as Canada's potential in the Arctic — the real reason this country is considered the future of maritime trade. Canada's control over the Arctic could unearth unprecedented opportunities for economic growth, resource extraction, and geopolitical influence on the global stage. If all goes according to plan, Canada could irreversibly reshape the global maritime trade dynamics. Of course, that's a big if. Why? Well, not all countries are exactly on board with Canada's aspirations in the Arctic, with the US being amongst them. But before diving into the challenges of Canada's ambitions, we'll first explore what it is about the Arctic that makes it such a coveted region in maritime trade. Let's start with the basics. The Arctic is a polar region located around the Earth's North Pole. This region encompasses the Arctic Ocean, adjacent seas, and parts of several countries. These are the countries and parts in question. Number one is the star of this video — Canada. Canada holds a substantial portion of the Arctic region, consisting of the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Yukon, and the northern parts of several provinces. Canada's Arctic is home to about 150,000 inhabitants, most of which are indigenous. Number two is the Kingdom of Denmark, which consists of three parts — Denmark, the Faroe Islands, and Greenland. As you might know, the last part, Greenland, occupies a vast portion of the Arctic region. Interestingly though, Greenland, the world's largest non-continental island, is only 15% inhabitable, leaving room for just 17 towns and 58 villages. The rest of the area is covered in ice caps, as most of the Arctic is, or at least was. But we'll come back to this soon. For now, let's mention country number three — Finland. Almost one-third of Finland's landmass lies above the Arctic Circle in the Lapland province. Still, this province is sparsely populated, accounting for only 3% of the country's population of 5.5 million. Other notable Finnish territories in the Arctic are Ostrobothnia and Kainu. Number four is Iceland, the country of fire and ice. Though this country isn't technically a part of the Arctic continental mainland, its entire territory is in the Arctic region. The Arctic Circle, however, only passes through two of its territories — Grimsey Island, some 25 miles off the north coast of Iceland, and Kolpense, over 90 miles off the same coast. Country number five is Norway, whose landmass is nearly 50% in the Arctic territory. This mass includes the following — the Nordland, Troms, and Finnmark counties, the Svalbard Archipelago, and the Jan Mayen Island. Approximately 490,000 people live in these Arctic territories, which is one-tenth of the total Norwegian population. But this isn't the only impressive figure in Norway's Arctic stats. The country's Arctic maritime area covers nearly 580,000 square miles, the equivalent of France, Germany, and Spain combined. Country number six is another Scandinavian nation — Sweden. Sweden's two northernmost counties, Vesterbotten and Norrbotten, are considered Arctic territories. Though these territories comprise approximately one-third of the country's geographical area, they're populated with only half a million inhabitants, a tiny fraction of Sweden's total population of about 10 million. Two more countries fall under the category of Arctic states. First up, and country number seven on our list, is the Russian Federation. Over 15,000 miles of the Arctic coastline belong to this mighty nation. This includes the following territories — the Murmansk region, the Nenets, Yamal Nenets, Komi Republic, and Chukotka Autonomous Okruks in their entirety. There's the northern parts of the Arkhangelsk region, the Republic of Saha Yakutia, the Republic of Karelia, and Krasnoyarsk Krai municipalities, in addition to the islands and archipelagos in the Russian part of the Arctic Ocean. 
As many as 2.5 million Russian inhabitants live in these territories, accounting for almost half of the total population living in the Arctic. And finally, country number eight, which could play a huge role in Canada's future maritime endeavors, is the U.S. The U.S. officially became an Arctic nation after purchasing Alaska in 1867. The country's territories above the Arctic Circle include the following. The North Slope Borough, the Northwest Arctic Borough, and the Nome Census Area. The U.S. has varied interests in the Arctic, with maritime trade recently gaining more prominence among them. But what makes the Arctic so crucial in maritime trade? The answer is simple. This region opens up new shipping routes and seemingly boundless opportunities. Unfortunately, these come at a colossal cost. You see, the only reason these opportunities arise is the melting of Arctic ice, a direct consequence of global climate change. The melting of the Arctic ice could wreak havoc on the world. For instance, it could sink countries like Tuvalu and the Maldives by the end of this century. However, many have perceived one consequence of the melting Arctic ice as positive. Where there once was ice, there's now navigable water. The more the ice melts, the more developed massive transit routes through the Arctic get. This primarily concerns two routes, the Northwest Passage, or NWP, and the Northern Sea Route, NSR. But we'll discuss these routes in more detail later in the video. For now, let's explore the effects of the increased navigability of the Arctic region. Of course, only one of these effects matters for the purposes of this video, the increase in Arctic traffic. Between 2013 and 2019, the number of single vessels entering the Arctic area increased by 25%. Soon, you'll learn why the year 2013 was monumental in the context of Arctic shipping. In the Canadian Arctic, fishing vessels and cargo ships led this incredible boost of traffic, rising by 106.2% and 122% from 2009 to 2019, respectively. All in all, the total traffic in the Canadian Arctic was multiplied by 1.92 in the same period. It nearly doubled. More importantly, these figures show no signs of slowing down. In fact, experts predict that nearly 5% of the total shipping trade worldwide could be deployed through the Arctic region by 2050. This means that whoever controls the maritime passages through this region stands to gain tremendous economic and geopolitical advantages. As things currently stand, Canada is poised to be the country in charge of this critical region, as the Northwest Passage primarily runs through its territory. In other words, Canada considers this passage a part of the Canadian internal waters. Of course, not all nations agree with this classification. But before exploring the challenges surrounding the claims on the Northwest Passage, let's see why this route is such a hot commodity. The Northwest Passage is a shipping route, connecting the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, subsequently making shipping from Asia and North America significantly faster and cheaper. With this in mind, it shouldn't be surprising that finding this passage was one of the primary quests of early explorers seeking more efficient trade routes between Europe and Asia. These quests go as far back as Christopher Columbus's time. Columbus sought a navigable passage as a trade route to Asia, but was blocked by either ice, rough waters, or the Americas. These attempts would go on for centuries, unsuccessful each time, making explorers believe that the Northwest Passage was nothing but a myth. This all changed in 1906 when Roald Amundsen, a Norwegian explorer, and six of his crew members successfully passed through the entire Northwest Passage. It took them three years to travel from Norway to Herschel Island, Canada, but every second of this voyage was well worth it, as it marked a historic achievement in the Arctic exploration. However, it's important to note that Amundsen's ship, the Gioa, was a small vessel that could easily navigate the intricate channels and shallow waters of the Northwest Passage. Over a century would pass before a commercial vessel had a successful journey through this passage. This honor belonged to the MS Nordic Orion, a Danish bulk carrier that traversed the almost ice-free Northwest Passage from Vancouver, Canada to Pori, Finland in 2013 instead of going through the Panama Canal. This move shortened the crew's journey by four days, allowed the ship to take 25% more cargo, and saved as much as $80,000 in fuel costs. 
This historic journey was responsible for one more crucial thing, a proposed route from east to west. Here's what this route would look like step by step, or better yet, stop by stop. The journey would start in the Davis Strait in Nunavut, Canada. From there, the ship would travel north through Baffin Bay into the Canadian archipelago. After crossing through this archipelago, the ship can continue toward the Beaufort Sea. The Chukchi Sea is next in line, and the ship could use it to exit into the Bering Strait, separating Russia and Alaska. For now, this route is sometimes only possible with an icebreaker escort, although some vessels have made the journey without one. But if the Arctic ice continues melting at the same rate, the region could be ice-free in the summer months in the near future, eliminating the need for this type of escort completely. Though scientists are still debating when this could happen, most agree that the Northwestern Passage could become substantially more accessible between 2040 and 2059. When this happens and the Arctic fully opens for maritime transport, shipping patterns worldwide will change irreversibly. After all, why would a ship traveling from Japan to Western Europe travel 13,000 miles through the Suez Canal when it can pass through the Bering Strait and slash its journey by as many as 6,000 miles? That's almost half the distance of the original journey, which in turn means half the cost. Talk about a game changer! Of course, this also means that the Suez and Panama canals would likely experience a significant shift in their role, significance, and, naturally, revenue. At the same time, the Northwest Passage would see an impressive increase in traffic, influence, and revenue. The same goes for the country controlling it. Now, the Arctic countries are generally friendly toward each other, with established cooperative frameworks like the Arctic Council. But with so many economic and geopolitical benefits in the balance, maintaining this camaraderie may face tests. To make matters worse, the eight countries we listed at the beginning of this video aren't the only ones that could seek a stake in the Arctic's potential opportunities. You see, besides the eight member states of the Arctic Council, there are also 12 observer states. However, one among these has the most to gain from the changing dynamics in the Arctic. China. As an economy based primarily on manufacturing for the Western world, China sees the Arctic as the crucial arena for economic opportunities. After all, the Northwest Passage would make the Western world immensely more accessible, shortening shipping times and costs. This would, in turn, help renew their competitiveness as rivaling countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh threaten to undercut China's manufacturing dominance. With this in mind, none of these recent moves should come as a surprise. In 2016, China's Maritime Safety Administration published a 356-page guide on navigating the Northwest Passage. In 2018, China's officials declared the country a near-Arctic nation. And in 2023, China's first domestically built polar icebreaker, Xuelong-2, entered the Arctic Circle to begin a scientific expedition. Sure, China claims that it would respect any international laws put in place. However, given the country's track record with territorial claims and disputes, you would be justified in approaching such assurances with skepticism. But what about the Arctic Council member states? Well, the Northwestern Passage goes through the waters of three countries — Canada, the US, and the Kingdom of Denmark. However, arguably the most significant conflict in this regard is between the US and Canada. This probably comes as a surprise to anyone familiar with the history between these two countries, as they've always maintained a friendly relationship, at least on the surface. The problem lies in the designation of the Northwestern Passage. As previously mentioned, Canada considers this passage to be an internal waterway. The US, however, advocates for the Northwestern Passage to be declared an international waterway, allowing for complete freedom of navigation. This is conventionally done when a navigation choke point might restrict specific countries from accessing an ocean. By declaring this waterway as an international strait, all nations are granted unrestricted passage for their ships, without interference from the coastal state. Take the Danish Straits as an example. Even though they're fully surrounded by Denmark, they've been declared international waterways to grant the Scandinavian and Baltic countries access to the ocean. The same goes for the Danube River, which offers ocean access to landlocked countries like Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. According to Canada, the Northwestern Passage significantly differs from the previous examples. The main difference? The passage's usefulness. 
You see, Canada argues that a significant number of ships had to traverse a route successfully before it could be declared an international waterway. In the case of the Northwestern Passage, this figure has only reached double digits. In addition, with no country in charge of the Northwestern Passage, this route can be quite a dangerous endeavor. Why? There are no search and rescue capabilities nearby. This means that if a ship went through this passage blindly and encountered a problem, timely assistance and rescue operations would be near impossible. However, if Canada were to charge passage fees similar to those for the Panama or Suez canals, it would have both the resources and the responsibility to implement a robust search and rescue system to police the route. But then again, the total control over the Northwestern Passage would allow Canada to essentially dictate which ships are permitted to pass. This, in turn, means that the country would have a huge influence on the economies of major manufacturing nations. Let's say Canadian officials decide to ban Chinese ships from traversing the Northwestern Passage while granting access to the Vietnamese ones. This single move would make Chinese goods uncompetitive for the Western markets, dealing a major blow to the country's economy. This scenario makes it even more evident why this issue is so contentious. However, most experts familiar with Canada's operations in maritime shipping fully trust that Canada would adhere to international laws and regulations, maintaining a fair and unbiased approach to the management of the Northwestern Passage. After all, we're talking about a country that was a founding member of the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, in 1948, which sets the global standards for safe, secure, and environmentally sound shipping practices worldwide. In December of 2023, the country was re-elected to the IMO Council, continuing its work in various fields of international maritime shipping. Interestingly and importantly, one of these fields is also the Arctic cooperation and protection of polar waters. Canada spearheaded the development of the International Code for ships operating in polar waters, or the Polar Code for short, establishing safety and environmental standards for ships operating in the challenging conditions of polar waters, including the Arctic. In 2024, the country also plans to propose the establishment of an Emissions Control Area, or ECA, in Canadian Arctic waters, aiming to mitigate the environmental impact and protect the valuable Arctic ecosystems integral to the Inuit way of life. Canada is also a leader in marine biotechnology that promises to yield groundbreaking discoveries in the future. Through the National Seafarers Welfare Board, this country also strives to enhance the well-being of seafarers, addressing the unique challenges of those working in the Arctic waters. Similarly, through investments in the Marine Training Program, Canada aims to attract more women, indigenous people, and northerners to pursue careers in the marine sector. Currently, women make up only about 1.2% of the global maritime workforce. All of these moves clearly signal one thing. Canada is serious about the maritime sector. This should put any doubts regarding its commitment to responsible maritime shipping in the Arctic region to rest. Of course, all these initiatives and moves aren't simply out of the goodness of the Canadian officials' hearts. The truth is that maritime trade is a crucial part of the Canadian economy and way of life. After all, this country has the longest coastline in the world and ports of call in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Arctic Oceans, as well as the Great Lakes. In 2022 alone, marine trade directly generated nearly 30,000 jobs while reaching a value of $345 billion. This figure meant that Canada was responsible for 23% of the total international trade. In the same year, ports and marine shipping brought in $194 billion of Canada's total imports by value, while accounting for $151 billion of its exports. During this year, Canada port authorities handled almost 340 million tons of total cargo volume. Even with these mind-blowing figures, the maritime sector holds a lot more untapped potential for Canada and its economy. With over 1.35 million square miles of Arctic territories under its control, it's clear that the Arctic region is key to that potential. 
With the opening of the Northwestern Passage, Canada could stimulate its historically underdeveloped regions in the far north. Also, if a large portion of the world's maritime traffic headed through the passage, these regions would quickly become vital shipping, trade, and logistics hubs, boosting their population. With all of this in mind, we have one more question to answer. How can Canada prepare for the opening of the Northwestern Passage to shipping? Currently, there are no agreements policing who can and can't pass through the Northwestern Passage. The only existing agreements are between the US and Canada. For instance, the 1988 Arctic Cooperation Agreement dictates that the US must request Canada's consent to send an icebreaker through the Northwest Passage. However, with the increased monetary gain on the table, it seems that the US has started disregarding this agreement. This only reinforces the need for a new one, which wouldn't necessarily be limited to the US. This agreement would reflect Canada's policy that the Northwest Passage belongs to its internal waters, and as such, it's fully under the country's control. It's also worth mentioning that Canadian officials never even implied that this passage would be off-limits for specific countries. All they said was that the journey through this passage would be under Canada's terms. Now, speaking of these terms, Canada has two options. Charging passage fees and allowing free use of the Northwest Passage. Let's quickly break down each of these options. Charging fees to users of the Northwest Passage would bring two major benefits to Canada. One, it would reduce the number of ships traversing the passage, thus protecting the Arctic ecosystem and its people. And two, the country could raise money for numerous maritime endeavors, from investments in search and rescue capabilities to environmental conservation initiatives. Canada could also use this money to help indigenous people continue living their lifestyle. This option would likely make the passage through the Arctic financially unsustainable for many groups and companies. This means that Canada probably wouldn't impose any other specific regulations on the users of the Northwest Passage. In other words, charging them is enough. This move could possibly appease nations disagreeing with Canada's ownership claims over the Northwest Passage, as it would restrict their travels only monetarily. For option number two, Canada would allow free use of the Northwest Passage. Of course, by free, we mean free of charge, as this option would likely come with other limitations regarding safety, the environment, and navigation. Still, a free passage would likely attract significantly more ships from all over the world, increasing Canada's standing with other nations. After all, Canada would be the country that allowed them substantially cheaper trade. Among these nations, Canada would probably benefit from Asian partnerships the most. Asian companies viewed the Northwest Passage as the ideal opportunity to reduce costs and expand their business. If they were allowed to use it and do so for free, they would likely be more open to bilateral agreements that would immensely benefit Canada in the long run. Of course, opening the Northwest Passage to free trade comes with numerous environmental threats. Oil spills, pollution, and noise interference are just some of them. These threats could severely impact the traditional way of life for the Inuit people. That's not to mention how damaging they would be for the environment, setting Canada's green initiatives back considerably. Based on these factors, you could probably conclude that the first option would be significantly more beneficial for Canada and its people in the long run. Now, there's just the small issue of getting other nations, chiefly the United States, to agree to Canada's stance on the Northwest Passage. Many experts believe that the US should, and will, eventually accept Canada's claim on the Northwest Passage. Why? Because this is the only way to prevent China and Russia from laying claims to the same region. These two countries have already been making somewhat aggressive moves, and the last thing the US wants is to see the Arctic fall into the hands of nations with potentially conflicting interests. If the Northwestern Passage was officially considered part of Canada, the country could protect it possibly even with the help of the US Navy. But what do you think? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And if this video interested you, feel free to check out the real reason the US bought Alaska from Russia or this other video you might like. Thanks for watching.